Hello, everyone. Yay. Welcome to the Mass Reality Check. This is a, yeah, let's pop. Um, so Jeff and I, who is the program director, go through this every year. You know, do we have enough space for people? How will it be? I love that this is the problem we're having, that we're trying to figure out how many more seats to bring in. So thanks for all showing up, filmmakers especially, and those that are supporting. Um, making a film is not an easy thing. Making one of your major first films is also not an easy thing. Um, so, so thanks for being here. It means a lot. Um, we want to start off by thanking our um, festival sponsors. They're all at the bottom of the screen here for the entire festival, so take a look at them or look at them in your program. But the main ones for this particular screening are Documentary Educational Resources, Boris FX, The Independent Magazine, and NewEnglandFilm.com. Those are important because whoever wins this competition, and you're all aware that it's a competition, now you are, um, will receive prizes from Boris FX and from all of those other filmmakers. The top prize winner, um, which will be announced at the end of this screening, will receive one-on-one um, -on -one fo um, phone or meeting conversations, depending upon how the sponsors want to do it, um, with the filmmaker as well as Boris FX software. I'm told this software is pretty fancy pants um, and you can do a lot with it. Um, second runner-up and third runner-up will just get also the Boris FX. So I've seen the films. I love these films, and I'm not just saying that. I think we have a pretty strong um, roster this year, and I'm, I'm really proud of this screening. Um, thank you also for um, hosting us, SATV. Um, you guys have been phenomenal, and I'm not just saying that because cameras are on me. This has been a great, smooth running screening, so thanks, guys. Um, afterwards, we're going to have a Q&A, and so I'll just ask filmmakers to come on up, um, and we'll all stand here together. Um, this is being this is being recorded in hopes to be broadcast on the um, cable access stations, but we are still um, need full permission from that from filmmakers to do it. So just so you know, in case you feel like you have something controversial to say that you wouldn't want out there, that's that's your warning. Um, take a look at your guides. This is just the first the second day, sorry, of the festival. There's a lot of great films in it, and we're going on till next week. Um, and last but not least, it's just a little distracting if cell phones start going off, which they did in the last two programs. So please just go ahead and get into silent mode. Um, and that's it. I'm so excited. All right. Thanks. Roll the clips. This is 92.5 The River, Boston's independent radio. Sometimes, yeah, when like my, like there's things going on at home, I just get on my bike and ride to get rid of, to get rid of stress, stuff that's going on around school, the home. They're friendly, Danny and Steve. Um, they're really nice. They have low prices, and they be um, cooking people up, like me. Since the first time I walked in, he asked me, um, "Hey, what can I help you with?" I'm like, "Oh, my bike's messed up from the chain." He's like, "Oh, I got, I got you." They're, for the most part, really good kids. I see myself in them, just trying to get out of the house. And that's, that's what I was doing at their age. And the bicycle provides that for them. It's just, you know, something I didn't anticipate before I started here, you know, that you can impact someone's life, you know, like that in a positive way. Sometimes I'll have kids coming in, just hanging out, just wanting to talk. I didn't expect anything like that, you know. It gives me the sense that they feel comfortable enough with us to open up about their personal lives. 
that's good that you know teenagers can can trust an adult that much because when I was growing up a lot of the bike shop owners you know they wanted you to to, to get what you want and, and leave they didn't want to be bothered by kids by and large you know and I don't want to be that I want to be um, more approachable you know it's a bike shop A lot of young people believe that the quality of the ride comes from the bicycle. And I don't believe in that. I don't believe in products. I believe in people. A lot of these young kids get lost in thinking, I need a better bike, I need something lighter, I need something with more technology, I need uh, some, something else outside of themselves. Whereas I believe the majority of your attention should be focusing on yourself, the rider. What do you want out of it? Where you want to go? You know, when I was a kid, I didn't necessarily ride nice bikes that I do now. But that didn't change the quality of my childhood. Yeah, I want the seat right there. Oh, right, and the wheels. Yeah, yeah. The one that takes you places? That's how you can tell it's a Chicago Schwinn. Oh, yeah. I know the first two numbers signify something, but what it does. In this particular model, I don't. I've got a, a, a group of little kids who are probably in elementary school coming in here. They're too small to ride one of these bikes, but they still come in here, they still look, they still hope they can get a bike one day. The, the people are depending on us now. It's almost like we started something that the community doesn't want us to stop. It's gotten to a point where they're depending on us. There's been a lot of bike shops that open, stay open for a few years and fail because they'll make a mistake. I'm very aware that we can't afford to do that because our customers are relying on us, they're depending on us to be here for them. So I do get very attached to these kids um, because they are the future. They, this world is going to be their world very soon. You know, you say they're kids, but I see people that are two years away from being adults. You know, they're 16, two years, they're adults. I do believe how we handle them now is going to make a big difference in the future. Absolutely. Dear fellow committee members, the asphalt business owner from Salisbury is trying to put an asphalt plant a third mile away from here. Asphalt plants are not acceptable uses according to North Canaan zoning regulations. There is a state statute that says you cannot put an asphalt plant within one third of a mile of a water course or residences. This asphalt business owner is suing our town to try and get this plant here in our neighborhood. He is claiming it is a green plant and that it is a warm mix instead of a hot mix asphalt plant. So it's 33% cleaner, which means it still leaves 67% of dangerous asphalt fume, also known as inhalable benzene and crystalline silica in the environment. But really? Who wants any asphalt plant in their neighborhood? Who wants an asphalt plant near their well? Who wants to fish in a river that has an asphalt plant as a neighbor? So 
many areas in the country are changing. We have um, a small town. We have neighbors that we're all close to. A lot of the neighbors are family. We've lived here. We've built our lives here. We've invested in our homes and our future. And we, we look forward to turning that over to our children. If Metcalf Asphalt makes the claim that the coal patch asphalt does not leach into the soil, I'd like to know what they're going to do with the wastewater. We did not have an issue in the past nine years because I'm not doing anything wrong. I would like to cease to desist, cease and desist lifted so I can get back to running my company and investing in our town. Thank you. What would demon right? So we're just out walking around, handing out flyers, trying to make people understand what could possibly happen to our neighborhood. I've lived in Canaan for over 30 years now. This asphalt plant will change the character of Canaan. People ask me what I think about a green mix, warm mix asphalt plant. Well, it's greenwashing. It's making believe that it's better than, than the hot mix asphalt. A warm mix asphalt plant leaves 67 some percent of the bad stuff in the ground, in the water, in the air, um, in, the, in the employees' lungs. No need for that they have to come forward with some, some evidence that they're not going to harm the quality of life in, in North Canaan, East Canaan, Norfolk, Salisbury, Sheffield for that matter. wonder when someone comes to our town and has a business, um, where do they live? What is their connection to the town? So Mr. Metcalf doesn't live in our town. He doesn't have a house near the proposed asphalt plant or even by his business. His um, family, his children, they wouldn't be subject to a lot of the environmental concerns we have about that asphalt plant. If he wanted to run a sand and gravel operation, just like he bought, then go ahead and do it. But this is no place for an asphalt manufacturing plant.
I think that we experience loss in a whole bunch of different ways in our lives, whether it's loss that is actually somebody dying um, and that process of figuring out how we move on without that person, or whether it's loss of a job or a part of our identity. We also have loss um, that has to do with like more personal things about ourselves. As I've dug into this, I keep finding more things that are clearly pockets of loss. I'm Karen Krolock, and I'm a multidisciplinary artist. I began the Dictionary of Negative Space as an overall project about two years ago in response to um, losing my mom, my dad, and my brother in a car accident in 2012. And part of what I recognized when I was going through the aftermath of dealing with that accident was not only do people not have a tolerance in our culture for being around people that are suffering, um, and you become very isolated just because of that, but even really well-meaning people, when they try and interact with you, you don't have words. We have ideas, and when you talk to people that are grieving, they all identify that these things happen, but people outside of that experience have no idea that they're there and it's hard for people that are grieving to track them because they don't have a name. I had thought at first like there's maybe 30 of these words and I'll put together like a little chapbook type of thing and I began kind of gathering them up and, and putting them together and I began talking to other people about them. Really quickly I had over a hundred of these entries. Identifying these things has made it easier for me to understand the things that go on on a day-to-day -day basis. So like, we don't have a word for the last place that you saw someone alive. The last Saturday that I ever went out and did something with my dad by himself, we'd gone to see a show. After the accident, a few weeks later, we were walking through this neighborhood with just a group of friends. And, you know, because you don't know when something is the last time that it's going to happen, like, oh, I should have taken notes and this is all the things that happened. I'm walking down the street and physiologically, I just lost it. Like I began shaking and crying and couldn't identify why. But like my body clearly knew this is where this momentous thing happened. It had made notes on it, but like my brain hadn't yet. You know, it's really opened up for me being able to understand even the difference between what I know consciously and what I know physiologically and like how to pay attention to those things. And knowing that this must happen to other people, you know, that other people go through spaces and don't recognize why they're having a severe emotional response to something because we aren't tracking these things, we aren't mapping them. And then once we do, it starts making sense to people. I think something I've been realizing about my experience at Gordon, like being gay and being here, is like this feeling of like hopelessness that it's never going to be better. I think at Gordon, being LGBT plus is pretty difficult because there's really no one that you can talk to and really know it's going to be a beneficial conversation. Just the fact that like I couldn't really healthily explore who I am in like a safe space here, I feel like that's just been hurt me and like my development. I don't know, being in the closet gave me a lot of fear and anxiety and just uh, uh, I had suicidal thoughts. My parents made me go to Gordon because they found out when I was a senior in high school that I was gay. And they wouldn't allow me to speak to any friends that they thought that I was interested in. Um, they made me stop hanging out with multiple friends and deleted people's phone numbers from my phone. You know, it's almost worse the love the sin or hate the sin kind of thing because you're like, wow, there's this big part of who I am that's shaped every experience 
that I have. But there's this person who tells me that they love me even though they don't support, you know, a big part of who I am. Which is just really, I don't know, I feel like it's really harmful. So these are just parts of who people are and we can't accept that and I don't want to accept that we can't accept that. I kind of had a cognitive dissonance. Like, there's something that I've been taught is different from what I feel, and that was really confusing. What high schooler goes and like tries to learn Greek because they think like the fate of their soul lies in that? I don't know, but I did. I like tried to go and learn Greek. There's a difference between attacking people and thoughtfully disagreeing with someone, and those two can be life and death for some people. It took me a long time to feel comfortable with affirming theology, actually. I felt like I was lying to myself. Part of the reason why it's so scary for some of my friends is because they stand affirming. I'm bi, um, used to identify as lesbian, um, and stand non-affirming. Uh, so I think it was easier for me to come out on campus. Uh, I don't want to lose my entire friend group. I don't like that I have homophobic friends, but it would suck more to not have friends at all we concluded that the, the basic theological premise that undergirded sort of Borden's understanding of human sexuality, that that really could not change. As an evangelical institution that prizes scriptural authority, we, we came to the conclusion that it would require so much exegetical acrobatics of scripture to be able to get to a place to sort of justify something that would say that same-sex sexual union was something that would be appropriate in the life of the faithful community. We just could not do that. There's nothing like hearing that your existence is wrong, and especially hearing that your your existence is wrong in the eyes of God. A lot of people don't know what that feels like, and it makes it very hard for them to understand. People uh, say, like, well, you don't have to agree with it, or even follow it. Some people say that, but the fact that it's there, it makes me different than other students, and I don't want to be different in that way. I don't want to be the other and I don't want like to feel like everything that comes from the school is kind of has a clause added to it of like, well not for you. So that's how I feel about like the chapel office and all of the chapel things and all of the sermons and just anything that could be good and life giving. In my in my head and in my heart it always has like a clause, like, but not for you because you're gay. I went to gay club at Gordon where there were some nice people who were serious about justice and love. Oh, and that completely changed my life. It was just a bunch of queer people hanging out and playing board games and talking amongst ourselves about just life and everything. When I didn't feel safe, that was a place where I felt safe. Um, it was a place where I got to know people. It was just fun. Um, <laughs> it's funny, they pass out the pins, and that's really cool because you know exactly who people are and like, um, who's a safe person and who's not. When I see those on backpacks, I know either they're of LGBT or supporters, and that's just nice. Because it, for me, it just shows that they're a safe person to like be around. I think it would be really cool if um, the queer community and just the general Gordon community if we were able to, as we were building community and as we were building relationships, to really find a common vision. When people are open to having healthy conversation, um, it will lead to a lot more fruition in dialogue. And also, yeah, for uh, my LGBTQ plus brothers and sisters that might not be out, hold on. Find a community, uh, stay safe, but courageous.
I'm learning to see things in the world. I'm kind of designed to connect with each other and the natural world, and we seem to be moving away from that. I had a wonderful teacher at one point in my life. She declared with such urgency and emphasis that we're the only species who foul our own nests. Dis-ease is really a wonderful word. It means you cannot be at your ease anywhere once what's in the air all around you is hurting you. My very body is saying, we're living in a world where our habits of consumerism and how we use energy is harming people. So I came up with this idea of, you know, feeling like I'm a canary when I first started to tell the people in the building that I've moved into that in general the building had so many signals that were contributing to poor health. Moving into a senior housing gives you a very different view of vulnerability in aging. I walked in and they were working on the final rug installation. There was a very, very heavy odor. And I said to myself, well, it's sort of new rug smell. I said I was going to postpone my move in and that I would put a couple of fans in that space and an air purifier and that I would keep the windows open. I actually did that all through October and November and part of December. So the big day came when I actually moved in and I knew there was this background odor. I slept there, I believe, two nights. I went to bed about 8.30 and I awakened at about midnight. My throat was burning, my eyes were burning, and then I tried to get out of bed and I started to feel dizzy. But I immediately connected it with, oh my gosh, you know, there's something in the air here. I, two days later, went to my primary doctor and he said, you know, you've been exposed to something very toxic. Whatever it is, is in that apartment and you just have to leave there. And so that began this whole journey of doctors and understanding of something called chemical sensitivity. The more official definitions say that your body can reach a level of toxicity where the adrenals are not doing the job they're meant to do. And so your immune system sort of shuts down. And then it's not just the chemicals that you were accustomed to having reactions to. It gets more and more subtle. An example of something that might affect me is um, I go into a, a local coffee house and I'm sitting there and I'm feeling comfortable and then suddenly someone will walk in the door and maybe sit at a table that could be almost 15 feet away from me. And if they're wearing a perfume, it's not like I smell the perfume and say, I don't like that, I better get away from it. My eyes start to burn, and especially my throat, my air passages immediately burn. And then I start to feel this pounding in my head. It's challenging. There's not a piece of my day that I can recognize as my ordinary way of being in the world. I am in free fall because of what I hear about the future of a disease like this that could 
put me in a situation of isolation. I met one woman who had to withdraw from life in a pretty severe way. And I had some internet contact with a man who felt pretty much the same way. I do not want to start um, going into the darkest places, which is that some people wind up having to live very isolated lives and live in entirely different climates and live in very isolated communities in order just to live. It's very frightening to imagine that the world is not safe. A hospital room would be a hostile environment for me because there's everything in the air in a hospital. When I have those moments, it's like not being held. There's nothing to hold you. And they're momentary, but they're very real. Very real. There's so much about our turning away from the direct experience of the natural world that seems to be creeping into our deepest psyche that we want so much artificiality around us, that we don't want anything resembling the, the trees and the air and the sunshine and the moonlight. We're hanging out with metal objects in our hands half the day. And when I walk in the park and I go over and put my hand on a tree, I feel more human, more fully human. We're so accustomed to artificiality and what is sort of unsuitable for this body that we've evolved in. This specific disease, I really do believe, if it had wider exposure, could somehow counter the chemical industry's ability to affect people's consumer choices about all the ordinary products full of chemicals that we have identified as not good for the human body. People's whole physical sensibility has been so neutralized around these substances and these artificial fragrances. They don't even think of the uh, implications of everything having a sort of artificial aroma. All of our consumer habits are swirling around this issue and people are just not aware. Every consumer choice we make is a place for that consciousness. Like, what is this product? And do I need this product? 
and what is it doing to my body and to the air I breathe. And from what I'm understanding about the present political situation, there are lots of things, there are lots of things being turned back about the environmental protections that we fought for. And it's very unsettling because at this point in my life, um, I'm not as hopeful. My youngest grandchild is seven. And I have a hard time believing that she's going to inherit a world that's safe. And with the cameras flashing all around him, he led 200 women into the warehouse. When they got to the shelves of sorrow, your wife searched for a bag with your son's name on it. But there was none. She searched through the boxes, but nothing. When she reached the shelf marked unidentified remains, she grabbed the bag. The bag full of bloody stuff. It's, it's a general thing that people always say about college. It's like you try to reinvent yourself, but then you end up realizing you're the same person you really were. And it's experiences that change you, not like forcing yourself to change. Specifically, when I first came here, it was like, ah, uh, yeah, I'm like a real fun party girl. When in reality, that's like not super what I'm like as a person. I used social interaction to sort of charm people as a defense mechanism. If you seem like a person that someone could like enjoy spending time with, it makes them less likely to like react with violence or rage when they find out that you're trans. That fear, that fear is still there like with how high mortality rates are for trans women. It's it's like a scary world. Everyone has a story of like a time they were threatened with death. Like I know I have a few. I I saw a therapist for like 7 years. And I think acting was almost more helpful than that. Acting was what sort of made me sympathize with myself. Let the washing begin. I learned how to actually talk to other people. I learned how to engage in a way that's not destructive. The Women of Lockerbie has been a fantastic learning experience. Um, I'm, I'm sort of past to the point where I need theater as like a crutch, and now it's just genuinely my art form. The cast dynamic is great. Um, over the course of it, we've all kind of bonded with some of the absurdity of what we're doing. We all kind of sat down and just had like a therapy session as our characters. We just all went like, yep, here's how I am, the way I am. Here's, the, here's what happened when the crash occurred. You, uh, uh, get a hold of yourself. We've talked about um, after, after rehearsal, like the coping mechanism, because when you, when you put so much of yourself into a piece, everyone always like leaves looking a little bit haunted. He wrote his name inside it too. If you'll excuse me off, I have to go and make a statement and somehow salvage this whole situation. It's just, I've been sobbing for the last four hours, just on stage. It's just what I've been doing with my evening. Everyone suffers in their own distinct and unique way, and that's, we can connect with each other on that front, and I think there's, there's a beauty in that. In my acting, I use like, a lot of different kind of techniques with trying to incorporate feelings into my character. A few memories of like, particularly for a play like The Women of Lockerbie, some painful ones, some hard ones. I'm gonna give you some interpretive things to think about. 
up, and I want you to be more haunted, more damaged <coughs> than, oh my gosh, this, 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 this. Do you understand what I mean? I want you to be more along the lines of spent. In, in scenes of feelings of helplessness, I'll often go back to like when I was a little kid and for the first 12 years of my life, I had my hair cut against my will. And that like feeling of like sitting and sobbing in the barber's chair, not really knowing why what was happening upset me so much. That's, that's something I can draw on for certain scenes. There is an overcoming adversity within yourself, even in performing, which is one of the reasons I've become so good at overcoming adversity with myself. It's like literally my job now. <laughs> the ghosts in the ground, are not much different than the people here that are alive. And life can't go on until something has been done. There's, there's human nature in all forms of art that everyone can tap into. I'm actually happy which is shocking because I didn't think I'd get this far. So now I'm sort of making it up as I go along because I'm like, I, I didn't think I'd make it to college to be completely honest. So now I have to like actually plan for a life that's ahead of that. <laughs> Remember? I, solstice, the winter solstice. Every December 21st, we'd go up there and light a bonfire. Sit up all night and wait for the return of the sun. And when it appeared, we'd pop the cork and taste the coming of spring. <laughs> Things are different now. Bye. If you walk through Eggleston in Boston, which is part of Jamaica Plain, there's a great culture of Latinos. There's many um, stores, grocery stores, there's many restaurants that are owned by Latinos. These immigrants come and have this culture that they now bring to um, this neighborhood. If areas like this gets gentrified, that culture is then lost. Certain aesthetics that these people bring are completely disappear. Gentrification could definitely have a humongous negative impact on neighborhoods. I became an artist when I got a job as a painter at Artists for Humanity. Then I found that Art was so powerful. If I wasn't in the place or environment I was, I would have never got the opportunity to become who I was or have the opportunity to now rebel against certification. This opportunity wouldn't been um, given if I was, like for example, displaced very far from the resources that are held in Boston. I definitely hope that my community um, stays the, same, the way it is and I would hate to see neighbors or like friends that I grew up with being removed. So people from diverse cultures, from backgrounds, they, everyone just brings a different um, perspective, a uh, different um, point of view, and many people from different walks bring wisdom that are always um, shared in these neighborhoods. I would hate to have that be um, destroyed.
Biologically, can you describe what's going on in a girl's body when she gets her period? No. <laughs> Do you want to try? <laughs> what? Do you want to try? I think it's something with like an egg bursting or something. Bursting? Uh, it's... No, I cannot. Do you want to begin the journey? Begin the journey. Okay. Take me on the journey. Legs will be produced in like in your ovaries and then go through the fallopian tube. And then it attaches to the uterus like wall lining thing. A type of like shedding of like the ovarian lining. Do you know why that happens? No. Nothing about like the egg moving? Or... No. Our bodies being prepared for pregnancy? I don't know. Growing up, puberty and sex are not topics we like discussing with young people. However, it's so necessary to have these talks. Growing up is inevitable, puberty is terrifying and confusing, and sex happens without education. Kids need to know about growing up, teens need to know about sex and what to do with it. With no birth control addict type, what is the bottom line chances a girl might get pregnant during sex? I don't know. 25? Well, at least 25 percent. What are the chances a girl might get pregnant during sex given any time during this? 190 percent. Don't have sex. Okay, that's fair. It's actually 30. <laughs> <laughs> Can you tell me what the cervix is? Somewhere down there. I don't know. Is it like kind of like a ball shaped thing? I feel like I should know that. Do you know what the cervix is? No. I wish I did, but I don't. <laughs> I think I had headphones in. Um, is it in a girl or a boy's body? Girl? Yeah. <laughs> is that the opening to the uterus? No. Yeah, yeah, it's pretty close. Do you know what PMS stands for? No. Postmenstrual something? Postmenstruation something? No. I don't know. Post traumatic. Premenstrual <laughs> <laughs> uh, cycle. Oh. Premenstrual. Think of the bad guy in The Incredibles. Oh, 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 um, syndrome. Premenstrual syndrome. Premenstrual syndrome. How long can you expect puberty to last for? I'd say two years. Five to ten years. A year or two? Four years. Yeah, four to five. <laughs> so, true or false? Acne tends to be equally as bad for boys and girls. True. It's actually false. One of the genders <laughs> has it works. Do you know which one? Girls? Boys. <laughs> <laughs> Which hormone do guys' bodies make during puberty? Testosterone, estrogen, or both? Uh, testosterone. 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 Both. It is both. It's actually both. No. Can a girl pee with a tampon in? I think so. No? Yes. Yes, they can. The truth is, public schools have inefficient programs. Only 24 states are required to have some sort of sex ed program. And of those 24, only 13 are required to be medically accurate. Can you just explain what your human growth and development or sex ed class was like? Um, I didn't have one in elementary school at all. So what did you do when you were like 10, 11, and 12? We had like anatomy books that like vaguely went over what puberty was. We had one lecture in fifth grade and that was it. And we just got a pamphlet that we had to give to our parents and my parents gave it back to me. I couldn't really say that I'd like taken a sex ed class. I didn't necessarily learn a lot. Well, guys learn about what happens with guys and girls learn about what happens with girls. It's divided between guys and girls. We separated the girls and the boys. Were you homeschooled? Yes. It was one-on-one -on -one with my father and then there were some fun conversations with my mom. No, I was homeschooled. I got the talk when I was like 10. My mom gave it to me. Uh, my dad was super nervous the whole time. He put headphones in and went in the other room. And then in high school, we had one sex ed class, but I couldn't take it because it didn't fit in my schedule. My guidance counselor was like, ah, oh, it's fine. You don't need to know that. I was left to figure a lot out on my own. I didn't necessarily know that like sexually transmitted diseases was a thing. For some reason, I know more about the sexual reproduction of flowers than I do <laughs> about like real sexual reproduction. <laughs> Parents also hold the right to opt out their kids from these programs. Without proper information and education, kids are growing into a maturity for which they're not prepared. So what do you wish that you did learn in school? Women's health was a mystery to me until probably a year ago. They probably were teaching an abstinence only, which is best, but you should also talk about protection. If someone has more questions, it's giving them a safe person to talk to. Without bias, 
of like religious belief. Even if you're pulling the whole Christian thing of like not having sex until after marriage, which is something like I believe you still like have to like learn about protection and like learn about STDs and stuff still. Although I don't know a whole lot personally about female sexual development, I feel like women know a lot more about men. And I don't quite get why that's a thing. Probably starting like middle school or something, like teach about both sides because it helps you uh, empathize a lot more with the other gender. More education, for, especially for guys, on what women go through would be very beneficial. The talk is advised to happen before puberty begins. Not in high school, not through what your friends say, not the internet. This is especially true for girls who mature earlier than boys. Not only do females mature at a more vulnerable age, our bodies are a lot more complicated. Our whole system down there isn't exactly on display. Whether you're a single dad raising a daughter, or you're a teacher, a brother, a boy boyfriend to a female, please be educated on women's health. It's important for both genders to not be confused by these natural growths and to be comfortable and ready to face them on their own. Do you think consent should be taught in school? Yes. Yes. Definitely. Absolutely. Yes. Absolutely. Yes. Very much, yes. Teaching respect and boundaries. A person can't be intoxicated. Otherwise, if you don't talk about consent, it's rape. Consent is only when yes is heard. If you're going to talk about sex, you have to bring up consent. Consent must, must be taught in schools. It's not superfluous, it's not trivial, it's not a new trend. Consent is mandatory. Education is vital to growing up. We shouldn't be afraid or ashamed for talking about it. Make it easier on kids and please talk up the talk. Okay, I'd like to invite all filmmakers to come on up for our Q&A. Wow, we have a big group, and again, I love it. Um, so, where's the other mic? Oh, over here. Can you get this to work? Pass that back there. All right, we'll start with this microphone. We'll just pass. So, I'd love to have you introduce yourselves to the group. Um, say your name. Um, what film was yours? and um, what school you represent. Hi, I'm Jessica Banglow. I just did the last um, film on sex ed and I go to Gordon College. My name is Joe Bandy. I'm also from Gordon and I did Unseen. I'm Ted Parati. I'm from Endicott College and I did the East Canaan Asphalt Dilemma. I'm Michael Rody Rody, and uh, I did the Kite Night film, and I'm from Endicott College. I'm Justin Rye, I directed DS Bicycles, and I go to DePaul University. I'm Dan Harris, I go to Fitchburg State University, and I directed You Could Use That. I'm Kate Bromley, I also go to Fitchburg State University, and I produced You Could Use That. Um, I'm Flynn Drezzo. I did the dog one. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> it's called Daily Bailey because my dog's name is Bailey, and I go to Mass Art. So. Hi, I'm Roxanne Tal. I'm the producer of Neighborhood, the one about Roxbury gentrification, and I'm from Boston University. Thanks. So, while we, oh, it's working. Good. Um, so wide range of topics, wide range of schools represented, um, which is what made this a, a really great screening this year. So um, this is a question to all of you, and we're going to try to just pass microphones, and then we'll do um, questions from the audience. But if you could just talk a little bit about your process. How did you come to your film, find your subjects, gain access to them? Um, was it just a, you know, a, a course assignment, or you know, what, what, what brought you to say, I'm going to do this? Um, so my film I made last year, and it kind of sparked from 
I was hanging out with a friend who was male and mentioned, like, let's go to the grocery store. I need to get some things. I need to get, like, pads and, like, toilet paper for our apartment. And he had no idea, like, what pads were because he had only heard of tampons. And, like, I had to explain to him, like, what it was and what those things are in the store and know they're not diapers. And I was like, you're, like, 20 years old, and I'm just very surprised you don't know what this is. Um, the semester was starting back at Gordon, so I was coming back home from Seattle, coming back to Boston. So it's like film season because it's like winter. And so I had my camera the first week of school into our second semester. I just decided to film people around campus to be like, let's see how much we like really remember and kind of like did some research, tried to find some like pretty basic common questions to ask. And once I filmed and kind of realized there were patterns and some of the things that people were telling me, my story kind of developed from there. So yeah. Uh, yeah, so mine was uh, the prompt for my senior seminar class, who my professor, Dr. Gardner, is here supporting me today. <laughs> and um, so we had uh, to make kind of a senior thesis project, and the prompt just had to be kind of, I guess, self-made, but find a problem in the world, and then your project has to be in response to that. And so this was something that was on my heart, um, just having queer friends on campus. And so I talked to them a little bit about what a project or a documentary would look like that would kind of tell their stories best and then just got people that I knew and some strangers that that was kind of difficult to come in and tell their stories and be vulnerable with me and then put it together like that. So yeah. Um, so I live in this like really small town in Connecticut, like 2,000 people and like the main thing is farming and uh, like my family, like my mom gardens a lot and we eat a lot of vegetables. So like, once we heard that like literally a mile down the road there was gonna be an asphalt plant, got a little nervous and I was like, you know what, we should do something about this. So my mom was already heading up to committee so I just started to film her going around to neighbors around the, the house and uh, just uh, talk to community members and I was lucky to get a couple of their interviews and I wish I actually got to interview the asphalt owner, the, that would be been better, but yeah, yeah, pretty much asphalt, yeah. but. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, it was good, and uh, I was happy I got to do it. So, um, kiting is something that I've been doing with my family since, like, well, I can remember. <clears throat> and um, it's, it's a way to remember my aunt who uh, died from cancer. And uh, <clears throat> it's um, just something I've done my whole life. So we, I always wanted to do something about it. I, it's in the summer, and I thought, you know, this is something to do. I'm pretty bored. I was actually packing to go to Italy at the time because I studied abroad for the semester. And I was like, you know, I might as well just do this. If I don't do this now, I'm never going to do it. So I packed our bags, got my uncle on the phone, and we just went and did it. And I think it turned out really nice. Uh, <laughs> uh, my friend bought a bike from that place, DS Bicycles, and he thought, they had a lot of character, um, really inspired by them. He's a cinematographer for it. Um, he came to me for the idea, and I, I'm more of a director, writer, so I wanted to help him with it. Um, and so as soon as I met them, I knew they had a story to tell. There's a lot of character and um, really nice people. And the people in the area, just a lot of the young bikers are cool. I um, really love that place, so really inspiring. Yeah. Um, so Kate and I made this film as um, the one of the assignments for our intermediate documentary class, which uh, Kevin back here um, taught us. Thank you for coming out and supporting. Um, and you know, a, a friend of mine had a really interesting question. He had been asking a bunch of people. It was a very morbid question. If you could listen to one song um, before you died, like what would it be and why? And he started making a playlist, which I thought was really interesting, and that kind of prompted an idea we could interview people about um, what their answer would be and we were kind of tweaking it and we were thinking maybe something more uplifting like what's a song that's extremely meaningful to you and kind of what's the story behind that and we could collect a few stories and um, just through the documentary pr process it kind of morphed and evolved um, we interviewed our mutual friend bell who's in the theater program and during post-production, we tried to integrate the, the song that she had picked, which was Bravado by, um, by the artist Lord. And it was really difficult kind of getting rights to that song by a very big artist. 
and um, integrating it into the edit while also, you know, being able to hear what she was talking about. So eventually we kind of just decided, you know, the content of this and kind of her life story and, you know, about healing through art and finding community through art, like that was really what was the more powerful thing. So it was a really cool process of kind of, which is what I love about documentary is that you start off with something and it sort of turns into, you know, kind of its own beautiful thing. And that's, that's kind of how our, our story evolved. So. Of that film. Okay. <laughs> you can still think to um, I guess mine really started just as like my first video project, like sophomore year, was to be a portrait project about anything or anyone with like meaning. And I'm a very busy college student, so I had to think realistically. And obviously, I love my dog. But um, I. <laughs> I've done still photograph sets of her before um, with like her morning routine and like how she kind of depends on me, but she still does her own thing. Um, and even though I'm more of like a script writer, I really do enjoy comedy. And I think that there's a comedy in subtleties, even like without words and you all laughed. So yeah. I apparently did pretty well on that. <laughs> Thank you. So I made, this, I made this film together with my partner, Emma, but she can't be here today. And this is an uh, actual assignment where in, in our school class, which is visual storytelling, and our professor, like Jennifer Raffian, is over there. So both of us, even this is a uh, class assignment, but we really want to make a story that we are really passionate about. So we went to an event held in the Museum of Fine Art, and there was an event about gentrification, and we met uh, Wilson, the main character in our film. She, uh, he was sharing her ex uh, his experience as a kid growing up in Roxbury, and he found out the area is this is assigned to be gentrified. So he shared uh, his growing up experience and he also shared uh, his goal as an as a artist and how to um, use his painting to uh, like, kind of like solve the issue happens in Roxbury and we find that's really inspiring and that's why I want to do that story. Um, so that, because there's a really large crowd in here, again, I'm so happy, um, I'd love to Give it to the audience, and, and let's start there. I, just... I had a question for Joe. Uh, I enjoyed your film very much. Did you ever consider uh, 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 not disguising the identities of, of, of the students? Um, and did you ever consider the implications of sort of uh, showing them anonymously rather than being sort of proud of who they were? There, there is, I just wondered if it was in, in the process, was it always meant to be anonymized, or was this something that you came up with uh, uh, from, based on the reaction that people had to participating in the film? Thank you. Um, yeah, so I, um, Gordon is obviously, you could tell from some of their testimonies, a difficult place to come out. And really, something that I've learned just from talking to all of them is you can be in a place that really is super welcoming to you, but it still is a big deal to come out in the first place. So I kind of put that barrier up early on when inviting them because some of them aren't out to their families or to their friends and stuff like that. So I didn't want to put that pressure, but some of them were out on campus, but then I felt like giving them, putting that color with all of their shots, kind of let everybody have a little bit of personality um, and being themselves and individuals, um, but still, keeping that like anonymity so they didn't feel pressured to be seen around campus after I showed this and yeah, be vulnerable in that way. Very sure. Right in front of the okay. Come on over. <laughs> um, rather than not to tell everybody the feedback. Um, so for both the filmmakers from Gordon, I guess, uh, just um, curious about uh, the aftermath of the production and uh, how it was received by people within the classroom and uh, if people saw it outside and on the greater community. That's really... Yeah, I was certainly nervous about um, my topic, specifically the part of just about like sex and um, protection because that's just really not a conversation at our school at all. It's kind of a bit taboo because I think kind of like speaking about its existence um, 
might like enable students to go do something. That's really not the point I wanted to make. I just wanted to say that like to have the education does not hurt and like will help these students when they're older and maybe that enters their life at whenever, whatever time it does. So I wasn't sure how um, the school would take it and it ended up showing at like a screening that we had at our school. But after it had showed, um, some departments reached out to me, like biology department, and asked like, what can we do to like better our education? And I kind of like wrote a book of criteria of a potential night class where students could go if they really want to know how to be safe in their lives, future lives. And then we had something called Holistic Health Week where like every day kind of focuses on a different aspect of health. And the Thursday of that day was like our um, health, just like growing up and like um, our health and relationships. And so I talked with the woman who was leading that, and then they actually brought a ton of birth control to our campus, which we don't have accessible on our campus at all anywhere. And so the fact that they brought it and showed these 20-year-olds, 20, 20 22-year-olds how to use it for the first time, I was really happy for, because it doesn't mean they need to go out and do anything now. It just means when like the time comes, they'll not, it won't be like foreign grounds of what they're doing. So definitely nervous for a while but I think as the year went on more and more people started reaching out about like the spark cool conversation in our dorm and we want to talk more so yeah cool. yeah uh, Dr. Gardner was super encouraging during the whole process premiering it was I was a little nervous um, because yeah there are a lot of different takes on this subject on campus but everyone was super supportive and I've had a lot of people come up to me on campus and emphasize that the film had an impact on them, helped them understand people across the aisle a little bit better, because I think that was really my end goal was rather than, I mean, I, I, I remember a sign like freshman year at our like coffee club that was like the last thing anybody needs to hear is like the, what the Bible says about this or like everyone's heard that. And so it was kind of like trying to find a new angle to kind of humanize that whole conversation because it's really that argument's been done. Everybody's heard every take. It's time to start seeing each other's people, so. Starting a new dialogue, absolutely. Um, who else has a question from the audience? Yep. I have a, I have a question for uh, the uh, for Ted. I wanted to know what the status of the asphalt plant is. So the um, the guy suing the town, he uh, they stopped suing the town, but we had a problem. Our uh, I forget what to call him, but he uh, he like authorizes. Um, so if you want to submit a proposal for a plant or some new commercialized property, that guy messed it up a little bit and uh, denied him the opportunity to uh, build this. So he's suing the town. So he stopped suing the town now, and this guy really messed it up. So it might be going through. It might not. It's uh, it's kind of playing it by ear. There's another meeting in May, but it's uh, yeah. Did, did people know what he was, what he bought a sand pit? Yeah. Did, did he disguise his intentions? For yeah, so he built berms on all the outside around it. So he, the locals, which is, it's like my mom's morning walk, you couldn't even see what's down there. Mm -hmm. And he decided to start manufacturing this stuff called coal patch. It's cold patch and uh, it's it's less bad for the environment than hot patch, but it's 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 not good so, so he, he got under up he was operating. yeah so he's still operating with cold patch and uh, oh. mm -hmm. yeah, it's going right in the soil right in the water table but, yeah. the drone shots, by the way. Thanks. yeah there were a lot of drone shots in that can you talk about that a little bit too just was that yeah I uh, I got like a DJI Mavic two summers ago and um, I lived like right next to the river in the mountains so I love going up there and getting shots and like that kind of it's the kind of filmmaking I like to do Anybody else? Um, I have a question for, um, I guess, I guess whoever would consider themselves having made more of an observational documentary. So I, I look right at you, Flynn. Um, you know, how, how much of it did you feel like you had to um, intervene? You know, I mean, we all know that there's a little bit of setup that happens in things. Um, but, you know, did your dog just know what to do or you know how much did you put yourself in there how much did you sort of you know put yourself in there in situations that you wanted the dog to do things or not or um so we had two days of shooting yep and scrapped almost everything from the first day because well like it, the setup was just second was just different from the second day so it looked weird editing it together but um in my still photos it's all things that she just does and I just like get there and I hit click. However, in a video, my dog is um, 
nervous by nature. And so when she notices someone paying attention to her for too long, she likes to give you a wide berth because she, she's just very scared. She's a rescue, um, kind of. She's long story. But um, <laughs> so we had to kind of, she does these things normally. And that's what I wanted to capture was just like her normal behavior. However, once she notices that you're trying to capture her normal behavior, she starts acting strangely. So we kind of had to like get her to act, but like she's not an actress. So it was, so it was usually like me holding a camera or like putting it on a tripod and kind of like walking away and then having my mom over here um, hold a piece of cheese kind of off screen. Yeah, until she would like I would be away for, for like 10 minutes and then she'd go, okay, now the scene is safe. Now I can do what I normally do. And then I'd have to like cut out the 10 minutes of nothing on camera while she was like sniffing around to make sure it wasn't a trap. <laughs> but um, yeah, she does really well with still photography. That's very observatory. However, video, she doesn't always do what I want. Was, the, that, was that dog bone thing just a happy accident? Yes. That was awesome. Yeah, the, the beginning and the end is just what she does. The, the fact that she looked at me right before I turned off the lights, also not planned. That was just her finally working with me. <laughs> and, and Justin, it seems like maybe um, you could have watched the cyclists for hours. I, I really loved the yeah. wheels and the, and the shadows and all of that. So how much did you have to say to them? hey, just do your own thing, or I want you to do this specific, or... I got uh, the phone number of the kid who was in the beginning. Um, I forget his name, but I got him to, like, coordinate with them to, like, get there on time and for them to just do the thing in that parking lot. Um, they do that a lot. It's, it's like a place where they go to, like, be safe and stuff because it's kind of a rough area, so it's a nice place for them to, like, hang out and mm -hmm. um, be with the owner of the shop and stuff. Um, See, so yeah, it was kind of tough, but I got, like, 30 minutes out of them, yeah. That's yeah. cool. Very cool. Quick question. Can you raise I'm your hands? Sure. How many of you guys are planning to go into this professional filmmaking? Thank you. Wow. Mm -hmm. We have one more question in the back. Can you shout? Uh, Michael. Uh, Michael. The, <laughs> the home movies is really powerful. Yeah. Mm -hmm. How did you, what was your process with that? And did you, where did you find a machine to play those? Yeah. <laughs> um, so that was like a whole ordeal. So I actually originally shot this last summer and didn't have those home movies, didn't even really think about it. And I was like, all right, this is fine. It's not anything crazy special, but it's nice, you know, just the showing the day that we have. And then I'm actually in Florence, Italy, like three months ago, and Steve List, my professor, who's sitting right there, texts me, he's like, I'm thinking about your, your movie, and it'd be really good if you got some home videos. And I was like, of course. It's 6 a.m. my time right now, but like, of course, okay. So I go in. And um, my uncle actually used to be like a film nut. He used to film everything at every moment, and it was awesome. So a few days before Christmas, when I knew I'd see him, I went and I texted him, like, hey, can you bring a bunch of movies of you guys if you have them? And he's like, absolutely. Two days later, he comes in with this tray of just movies, like old VHS tapes, all that. And then there's the fun thing of, OK, where do I go to get these recorded? And I find out that like everywhere is like kind of crazy expensive to record it. And one of my friends from home has this little, uh, it's almost like a recorder for those old plugs that I don't know the name of because I'm too young. <laughs> um, and you, uh, it just records straight from that. Uh, you can, it's like a dazzle or something. You can find it on the web for like 30 bucks or something. You need the software. But it's really, it, it, it's not the highest recording, but for this it's perfect. Mm -hmm. And once I got that and went through probably close to like seven or eight hours of footage, mm -hmm. I uh, threw it in and had to fight with myself because at first I just wanted a little bit to throw it in so you know her, and then after you see hours of great footage of what she was like, also for me it was like my first time really seeing who she was. Mm -hmm. So it was one of those things that like, how could I not put this in the film? So I put in like apparently like way too much, had to cut it back a crazy amount, and then I think came up with something nice. I, did I answer your question? Yeah. <laughs> That's awesome. Cool. All right, well, without further ado, do we want to know who the winners are of this yeah. competition? No? They all, they're all winners, right? Yeah. yeah. So all winners. That's the thing we say, but I really do believe that. Um, 
All right, so I'm going to need your help with a drum roll. You're going to be patting on the table. So, third place winner of the Boris FX Fancy Pants software is Justin with DCS Bicycles. Speech or no? Okay. <laughs> okay, and this is where, you know, I don't want that Oscar moment to happen, so here I go. Um, second place. Did you plan this, the two of you? Standing right next to you, Dan Harris. You can use that. Very cool. Um, you have to just kind of imagine the software right now, uh, but you will, we'll talk about it over an email after this is done. Um, and then the first place winner is unfortunately not here. Canary Red. Do you guys remember that yeah, film? Yeah. Yep. Clap for her anyway. She's in LA right now. We're the study abroad program with Emerson. Um, so thanks, guys. Um, we'll be in touch. But um, this was a great time. So please stay for a photograph so that we can. I uh, have you all come back. Thank you.